Okay. So the direction in which the okay, uh, electric field will flow, thanks to this uh, induction, okay, this uh, polarization of uh, charges. And so what's going to happen here is that uh, there will be something called electrostatic equilibrium inside of this inductor. Because the electric, the magnitude of the electric field, okay, or the electric force, excuse me, will be equal to the magnitude of the electric, uh, of the magnetic force. So in this, when you set these two equations equal to each other, right, because uh, you don't uh, have to include the vector notation anymore because you're looking for the magnitude, right, uh, at, at its maximum. So when I talk about the maximum, we know that uh, QV cross V at its maximum is when the sinus of theta, okay, is uh, equal to one, right? Therefore, theta has to be uh, 90, 90 degrees, perpendicular. And so what happens here um, is that QV is equal, QVB is equal to QE induced. So this electric field is the one that's created, is generated by this Lorentz force that polarizes the charges. And so you cancel out the charges, you cancel out Q on both sides, and you end up with E induced is equal to DB. So this is the ratio. Uh, the electric field divided by the magnetic field is equal to its velocity, the velocity of the rod. And so you have that the EMF, right, the voltage that is induced, is nothing but negative uh, the electric field multiplied by the distance, which is L, right? So negative E times L. And then from that, using the definition that we just found, that the electric field induced is equal to the velocity times the magnetic field. So this over here, we can find uh, the equation for uh, the induced voltage, the induced EMF, in terms of the magnetic field, the length of this rod, and the velocity at which it's moving. Okay. So here's the body diagram okay of the forces the electric and the magnetic forces in uh, electrostatic equilibrium so this is what's uh, what's happened thanks to Faraday's law now uh, let's see what comes next all right so and of course the if if you connect this you know if you imagine that you're going to connect this this rod into some you know wire, and you close the circuit because essentially what this is, it's behaving as a battery. So when you connect it to a circuit, you complete the circuit, and a flow of charges will commence. So you'll have flow of electrons. Okay, so this is what will happen. It's essentially creating a battery out of nowhere, right? Pretty much, you just need a conductor. Uh, and a uniform magnetic field, and you just got to move the conductor, right, to generate that induced uh, EMF. Okay, so another way to derive this same uh, result is by simply taking the change in the magnetic flux with respect to time. So we know that flux, uh, magnetic flux is equal to V times A, right, the maximum magnetic flux we can get. Um, and then when you take that derivative, okay, with respect to time, Assuming that the magnetic field is constant, right, because it's in a uniform magnetic field, then you take the derivative, you use uh, chain rule, right? So you have to use the, the product rule as well, because you have to take the derivative of the first times the second, and so on. And you get that dB dt, because the magnetic field is constant, okay? So if it's zero, that cancels out, and you're only left with uh, d times dt, okay? So the ADT can be changed, right? You can uh, change it. You can change the area by the definition of what the area really is, right? So if you think about it, on the previous rod, in the, uh, over here, let me go back a few slides. Over here in the previous example, you see that the rod has a length of L, right? But then, if you want to find the area of this rod, you can think of it as a Riemann sum, right? So you can say that, uh, some my pen is not working. Um, anyways, but um, what I'm trying to get to is that uh, if you have this rod with length L, right, if you can use a Riemann sum uh, with a thickness, okay, of dx, right, infinitesimal thickness dx, you integrate it from, uh, you know, your lower and upper limits, and you get the area, right? So that's why we're uh, pulling out a infinitesimal 
thickness dx over here multiplied by the length of the rod, which is nothing but the area. Okay, and then you integrate that and you're going to get the total area. But uh, then we find that because dx divided by dt, right? So dx dt, the change of the displacement with respect to the time is equal to the velocity. We can change that and we say that it's equal to the length times the velocity. Therefore, we get to the same result, we get to the same equation, uh, the induced voltage, the induced EMF equals to the magnetic field times the length of the rod times the velocity at which it's moving. Okay, so this is Faraday's law of induction, and don't but a description of Lenz's law. So this is this is this is a consequence of the concentration of energy. Okay, so um, now uh, suppose that uh, there is no motion, right? Because we uh, we were talking about how uh, we can induce, right? A voltage due to a moving rod, right? When, when, what happens when this rod moves in a uniform magnetic field? But now we don't have anything that's moving, uh, but we'll, we'll still change the magnetic flux. As long as you change the magnetic flux, regardless of which parameter you're looking at, if you're looking at the area or if you're looking at the magnetic field strength itself, uh, you're going to have an induced EMF. So over here, you have an example of a simple transformer. Okay, so over here, uh, you have a changing current because, as you can see over here, these voltage source, right, will be uh, AC current source. So you're going to have a, a changing sinusoidal uh, current. And so what happens is you have that the magnetic field, okay, due to a solenoid, according to Lampier's law, right, you can derive that uh, supposing that it has N loops, right? So you tie N loops around the coil, it's equal to mu zero uh, times I, which is the current enclosed the number of loops. Okay, so then you can take dv dt, right? You, you can uh, change, you can find the first derivative with respect to the time of the magnetic field, and you find that it's mu zero times n times di dt. Okay, so, but remember that the field, the magnetic field outside of a solenoid is zero, okay? So what happens is that the Lorentz force is not going to do anything here, okay? It will not cause an induced uh, EMF. So, what happens here is that uh, what causes okay these uh, this uh, induced current right must be nothing but an electric field right. This changing magnetic flux must create a magnetic uh, an electric field at the outside of that coil right. And this you know uh, electric field will induce okay a current. And that's where the EMF comes from. Okay, so here we have an example of a rectangular loop moving at a speed, right? So in this case, it's uh, you know you can think of it as two rods, okay, connected, um, moving at a speed v with a uniform magnetic field behind it, moving, uh, into the page. And so uh, the question is, does current flow? Well, um, if you think about it, these um, this Magnetic flux, okay, which is nothing but V that dA, is not really changing, right? Because the area of the loop is the same and the magnetic field is uh, constant, right? It's uniform. So therefore, d phi dt is zero. There is no flow of current, no induced uh, current. Okay, but now here is the question. So if you have the loop of wire, right, moving outside of the uniform magnetic field, is current going to flow? And well, of course it will, because what happened is that uh, the magnetic field, the area, right, of the magnetic field is going to decrease. So if that's decreasing, it means that the flux is decreasing, right, because the area is uh, proportional to the flux. And so you're going to have uh, an induced EMF. So current will start flowing, okay, from uh, negative to positive, right? So electrons will flow from negative to positive, and you're going to have an induced EMF negative d phi b dt. Okay, now the question is where does it flow? Well, which way does the flow will go from, from A to B, right? In, in From A to D to C and then to B. And induce the uh, field and uh, current directions. So here is, uh, you know, another um, experiment in which you can calculate and you can find the change, okay, in magnetic flux. Uh, by simply putting a magnet in a loop of wire and then having an ammeter connected to it, you can find how much current you induce, right? And so 
what happened here is that um, in the second example, when you have an ammeter with the same loop, right, but then you add a circuit next to it, uh, and the circuit has a voltage source, right, uh, it has a resistor and a switch. So if you close the switch, right, what will happen is that current will start flowing through the switch, through the resistor, the loop of wire, and then what happens is that you're going to have, you know, and produce, you're going to produce a magnetic field, you know, according to the farm group, or uh, you want to be more rigorous, according to bio Savar law, you're going to create a magnetic field due to these moving charges through the wire. Um, and so what happens is that this magnetic field, right, the chain, this change in magnetic flux, because what happens is that instantaneously, you're going to change the, the total magnetic flux, okay, that's very close in, in proximity to the second Coil, right, the second uh, loop of wire. And so what happens is instantaneously you are going to uh, induce an EMF on I2, right? So I2 will be induced, and that I2 will create another magnetic field that will oppose, right, according to Lenz's law, the change magnetic flux. So this is what's happening. And then after you open the switch, uh, the current will flow in opposite direction, right? Okay, so. Uh, when you close the switch, uh, dV dt is greater than zero. It's increasing, and when you open the switch, right when you uh, when you cut the the circuit, so when you stop, uh, when you don't let current flow through it, you're going to have that dV dt is less than zero, so it's decreasing. Okay. So this is uh, Faraday's law, of, um, you know, induction. Um, this is basically what we talked about. We talked about how the negative sign plays a role as a consequence of conservation of energy uh, by Lenz's law. And uh, of course, flux, the, the rate at which flux changes with respect to time is measured in Weber's, Weber's per second. Okay, that's the unit for magnetic flux, Weber's. And of course, uh, the units of time will be seconds. So Weber's per second will be nothing but uh, voltage. Okay. So, um, so we talked about several ways to uh, change magnetic flux in order to induce an EMF, right? So we can do it through a coil. We can change the area of that coil or the loop, a wire. Uh, we can change the angle between B and the coil, right? So if you change the angle, you're going to have a bearing magnetic flux, okay? So rotating coils is pretty much a generator, okay? It creates a generator effect. Okay, so here is an example. A numerical example, uh, it shows you the answer, but uh, you know, good if you try it on your own, on your calculator to uh, confirm it, prove it to yourselves. I hope that you tried the problem that I sent you last night. It's pretty similar to this. Uh, so what you do, you know, you have a magnetic field flowing through a loop, right, that increases by one tesla in one second. So this is pretty much, uh, you know, the voltage, right? So you to, to find the voltage, you have b dv dt. So 0.1 divided by one second will be uh, the voltage, right? But then the area, you have to consider the area. So you have to multiply the magnetic field by the area, which is 10 to the negative 3 meters squared. Um, and so you get that the voltage is minus 10 to the negative 4 volts. Okay, and then if you want to find, right, per second, they ask you, if they ask you in the exam to find the induced uh, current, right, then you just have uh, Ohm's law, right? So V equals IR. So to find I, you just have V over R, and you just plug the numbers in. If you have a resistor, you plug your resistor, and you have a uh, current. Okay, here is um, an example of um, a slide wire. So what happens here is that uh, you're going to have, okay, two rails, two conducting rails, right? The, the orange uh, rails will be conductors. You have a resistor connected. Okay, with resistance R, and uh, there will be this, uh, you know, this rod, this slider moving from left to right at a speed of V, constant speed, right? That means that there is no friction in between the rails and the rod. Um, and so what, what is happening here is that the area, right, the area over here that is covered by the rod and the rails, right, will increase, right, as the speed increase, as, as, as the rod moves farther and farther as the, uh, you know, displacement increases, you're going to have a greater area. And when your area is not constant, right, when it's changing constantly, you have a change in magnetic flux, right? And so 
when you have a change in magnetic flux, you know well that you're going to have an induced EMF. Okay. So over here um, we have that you know the same we can use the same equation uh, that we derived previously for the rod uh, in electrostatic equilibrium, which is EMF equals to negative BLB, right? Magnetic field times the length of the rod times the velocity at which it moves. And uh, okay, according to Lenz's law, right? Because we want to find out what will be the direction of this uh, current, right? What will be the direction of the current? Well, basically over here, if you take a look, it will, flow from, it will flow from positive to negative, right? And so the direction of the magnetic field has to be opposing the original magnetic field, okay? Because a change in magnetic flux, okay, will generate a current that generates a magnetic field that opposes the original magnetic field, right? So that's what's happening. So it will oppose, it, it will create a magnetic field B induced uh, in the opposite direction, which is out of the page, okay? And basically, like the battery, okay? So uh, now let's talk about uh, power, right? So over here, we have a drag force Fm. So what if we have a, a force uh, in the opposite direction, okay, that acts on the slider? So then we have to use the uh, force, okay, due to a magnetic field on a, on a, on a wire, right? On a current current wire, which is the current induced times the cross product of L and B, L cross B. And so you find the magnitude, you have ILB. So that means that the uh, induced current, okay, uh, you're going to have an opposing, you're gonna, you're gonna oppose the motion of the wire, okay? So there will be an external force uh, needed to keep moving the wire and so that the speed is constant, okay? So the speed must be constant. So to calculate power, we know that power equals the force multiplied by the velocity, right? And so you know that the force is nothing but ILB, and the velocity, well, it's pretty much V. So you have V, v squared times L squared multiplied by V squared, okay, divided by R. That's nothing but E squared, EMF squared over R. So this is one of the uh, equations for power uh, in terms of voltage and resistance. Okay, so here is a numerical example for you. Uh, you have a slide wire generator, right? And so it's moving with a speed V, 55 centimeters per second to the left. Um, and you also have a length L, 25 centimeters, right? From top to bottom, the vertical length. And the magnetic field that comes out of the page will be, uh, will be uh, uniform. So it's constant, it's 0.35 Tesla. So the first question is, to find the induced voltage, to find the EMF generated. So we use power this law of induction. We say that uh, the EMF induced is nothing but uh, the negative change in the magnetic flux with respect to time. But in this case, for the slide wire generator, we can use the derivation of the magnetic field multiplied by the length times the velocity, the equation. Uh, we plug our values in, okay, and then we get that the that the uh, voltage is nothing but uh, minus 48 millivolts, okay, or 48 uh, volts to the top times 10 to the power of negative three. And so what will be the direction of the magnetic field? It has to be opposing, right? Opposing the original magnetic field, okay? Because according to Lenz's law and the conservation of energy, it has to oppose that change, okay? So it will be into the page as opposed to out of the page like the uniform uh, magnetic field, the original magnetic field. Okay, so it has to. You always take a look at you know where, because you don't really know where the. Uh, well, you know that the, the current has to flow from positive to negative, so that's always the case. Okay, but then uh, if you want to be sure, you just have to ensure that the magnetic field, the direction of the magnetic field, will be uh, into the page. Right, it has to oppose the original magnetic field. Okay, so now let's say that they ask you to find the current. You use Ohm's law, uh, V equals IR, you solve for I, and then you get 2.67 milliamps. Okay, and it's clockwise, right? It's in the same direction as yes, uh, if you use the thumb rule to find that the magnetic field is into the pitch. Okay, uh, to find the power dissipated, you use the power equation, uh, V squared over R, 
plug in the numbers, 48 millivolts squared divided by 18 ohms, right? Um, and then um, you have that it's equal to 1.28 and 10 to the negative 4 watts. Okay. You can also use the uh, alternate equation power, I square R. Okay. Um, now, how do you find the power uh, you know, needed? Move the slider at constant speed, right? So what happens here is that you have to set the power equals to the force times the velocity. So that's nothing but ILVV, right? You plug your numbers, okay? Because it has to be uh, equal to, you know, the power needed in order to, you know, you have to apply a force in the opposite direction, uh, okay? So that the velocity stays constant. So you get that it's nothing but equal to the original power, right? That is dissipated, which is 1.28. It's negative uh, 10 to negative 4 watts, so it's equal and opposite. Okay, so uh, here's another example for you. Uh, so you may answer the question. So the question is a uh, circular loop of wire over here in the example. The green loop is uh, in a uniform magnetic field. Okay, the red crosses, so it's going into the page. Uh, okay, so it has the, it's in that area. So plane of the loop is perpendicular to the field lines, and uh, which of the following will not cause a current uh, to be induced in the loop? So what do you guys think? Is it A, sliding the loop into the field region from far left, B, rotating the loop, okay, the axis perpendicular to the field lines, uh, C, keeping the orientation of the loop fixed and moving it along the field lines, or D, crushing the loop, uh, E, sliding the loop out of the field region from left to right. So what what will not cause okay a current to be induced? So essentially the question is, what is it that uh, is not going to cause a change in magnetic flux? Any suggestions? Think about it. Think about what flux is, right? It's beta dA. So try to figure, try to picture what's going on for each tensor choice in your head. So for A, the, the loop, you're going to move the loop, right? From the far left, okay? From, from, the, uh, from the far left to right, right? So, so what's going to happen? So if you move it into the uh, field region, okay? From the left, you're going to have a change in flux, right? So that, that's not going to uh, be the right answer. Now, um, so what, what, what do you guys think is the answer? Anybody? Okay, so let's look at, take a look at answer choice E. Okay, so if you slide the loop from the um, okay from the left to the right, okay, what's going to happen is uh, okay, if you if you do it out of out of the field, right, you're going to have a change in flux because the area will be changing, right? Now for D, if you cross if you crush the the loop, you're going to change the area, so that's not good. You're going to have a change in flux. We're looking for what doesn't generate okay a current. And induced current. Now for C, we keep the orientation of the loop fixed and moving it along the field lines, right? So basically, you have the you have the loop in the same position, right? And then you you can move it per se. So the field lines move into the page. So if you move it along the field lines, what will happen, right? The area is the same. The magnetic field is uniform. It's the same. Nothing's changing. Nothing's changing. So there's no change in magnetic flux. Therefore, there's no induced voltage. There's no induced EMF. Okay, so the answer choice, uh, the right answer will be answer choice C. Okay, so uh, here is nothing but a uh, you know a little um, addendum to Lenz's law. Okay, so this is basically what we talked about, right? We talked about how, um, according to you know. Lenz's law, when you generate an induced EMF, 
because you're changing the magnetic flux, right? Basically, you have you have the magnet. You, you put put the magnet into the into the loop of wire, right? When when that happens, the strength of the magnetic field in, through the cross section of the loop of wire will be different, okay? Because remember that the strength of the of the magnetic field will be greater when the magnetic field lines are closer. When the spacing is less, the strength will be greater. Therefore, at the cross sectional area, uh, you know, which is constant, the strength which is changing, right, constantly. That's why the magnetic flux is changing because you have a different strength, okay, for the same cross sectional area. The area is the same, okay. Now, when you pull it out, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, according to the conservation of energy, you generate a induced current that will oppose, right, the change in magnetic flux. But what that means is that if you can it's an uh, example over here. Let me see if the pen works already. Yeah. Okay. Anyhow, so take a look at the first example. The current is flowing. Okay. So if you take a look at, uh, let's say that, uh, you know, you are in the, you are the magnet, right? So if you are the magnet, you're looking at the loop in such a way that the current will flow counterclockwise, right? So I picture that in your heads. And so what happens is that, so place that coil in, in your in your, uh, in your your screen, right? So if you put that coil on the screen and then the current will flow counterclockwise, using the thumb rule, the magnetic field will flow outside, right? It will flow out of the page or the inner part of the coil. And that's expected because, as you can see, right, the magnet has a north pole coming towards the uh, the loop, right? And so what happens is that the magnetic field lines come out of the north pole, they come into the loop of wire. So if you are the magnet, right, thinking about you being the magnet, you're looking at this loop. So the magnetic field lines coming out of you will go into the loop of wire. But then that current that is induced has to oppose that change in magnetic flux, right? Because energy has to be conserved, and so you have that. Uh, you have that. Uh, you know, it's opposite to the original direction of the magnetic field. It's changing as well, right? Because as you move it faster, if you move it faster, the strength of the magnetic field will be greater. Okay, so therefore the voltage induced will be greater, and the current is proportional to voltage. Therefore, you produce a stronger magnetic field. Uh, in that cross-sectional area, which gives you nothing but a flux opposing the original flux. So that's Lenz's law. It's very important uh, not to forget about Lenz. Okay. So um, here's an example. So I hope I get some answers. You can drop them in the chat, or you can uh, unmute yourself. You can interrupt anytime you have any questions. Uh, for this question, 11 uh, to Point two is a circular loop of wire, right? Uh, is falling towards a straight wire carrying a steady uh, current to the left. Okay, so take a look at that for a second. Uh, when they say it's falling, they are not saying it's falling due to gravity. Uh, it's a little misleading, right? They should have said it's moving uh, with a constant speed, B, downward. Okay, so that's what's happening. You're moving with a constant speed. Uh, now, what is the direction of the uh, induced current? In the loop of wire, right? So what what is going to happen? So the green loop. Take a look at the green loop. Um, okay, where where has to be the uh, in which direction? Counterclockwise or clockwise, right? Because remember, according to Lenz's law, you have to oppose that change in magnetic flux, right? So what's going to happen? Are you going to choose E? I will agree with the, whatever the majority chooses. I think there are better choices. Take a look at uh, A or B. Which one do you think? <coughs> is? What will be the direction? So clearly, somebody said A, clockwise. OK. What else? Anybody else wants to suggest anything? So let's take a look at answer choice A. So if it flows clockwise, use the thumb rule, right? Use the thumb rule to see in which direction okay, the magnetic field will flow, 
right? So it, it's going to flow into the page, right? So it's not really opposing that uh, that change okay, in the magnetic field. So, but but think about it. Somebody said B counterclockwise. Okay. So if it's counterclockwise, okay, the magnetic field will come out of the page in the inside of the loop, right, in the cross-sectional area. Uh, but now, think about that, because if, if you think about this, the, the loop of wire, right, is moving with a speed V. So uh, what you can say is that, uh, you know, QV cross V equals to the force, so there, there, there can be a force for each particle in there. Um, also, the um, you know, in this case, it's a loop of wire, so you have a symmetry. And what's happening is that the field is constant, right? And the area, okay, the area around it is also constant. So you might have a force induced in the charges, you might get a polarization, but uh, the magnetic field, uh, the magnetic flux, okay, will not change, okay? The only time when it will change is if, per se, the uh, loop of wire crosses the, the long, uh, why, right? So essentially, there is no direction, there is no induced, no induced magnetic field, uh, right? Because clearly the magnetic flux is constant. The area, the cross-sectional area, uh, uh, and you know, and the magnitude of the magnetic field going through that area is the same, even though it's moving, right? It move, it's moving clearly, right? But uh, it doesn't mean that it will generate. Okay? It, it will change its flux. So it's zero. There's no direction. Now for 11.3, the loop continues falling until it is below the straight wire. Okay, so see, this is what we were talking about. Second case, right? So when it's falling uh, below the straight wire, what will be the direction of the induced field on the uh, uh, current, right? So is it going to be clockwise or counterclockwise? So this time it's not C. It's not zero. What's going to happen? Okay, think about it. Any answer choices? Think about Lenz's law, right? If you have if you have field lines coming in, right, and they're increasing, if you have an increasing number of field lines coming into that cross-sectional area, according to Lenz's law, you want to have the opposite, right? Because of cons conservation of energy. So you want to have you, you want to have a current that will oppose that changing magnetic flux, uh, right? So think about it. If you have more nuts, uh, right? You want to have less of that. You have more crosses to counteract, uh, right? So what will be the direction of the uh, of the current? Don't worry about the magnetic field outside of the loop. Think about the magnetic field that goes into the loop, right? Because this is how we can find the flux through the loop. Okay, so we find flux through the loop, then we can see there is a change in it, and therefore if it's changing, there is an induced current, right? Clearly, if it the magnetic field uh, direction is changing, right? Because if, think of, imagine the loop, okay, coming closer to the wire and then it comes to the opposite side of the magnetic field, right? So you have opposite uh, but equally magnitude lines, field lines coming out of that. Uh, Right in the bottom, so it's coming out of the page, and the top is coming into the page. So you're going to have more field lines coming into uh, out outside of the page, right? So if that's happening, okay, you have less of that. So you want to have more field lines going into the page. But how do you get that? So use the thumb rule, uh, okay, and then think about the loop and try to see in which direction the current has to flow. So then if you see clearly, right, you. So see my hand, if you see how the this is the thumb, right, is the direction of the current. If it flows in this manner, right, while this four fingers will be the field lines, that means that if you if you move the current clockwise, right, then you're going to have magnetic field going into the into the page, right? Or the inner part of the loop. So in that case, the current has to be clockwise, right? Because it has to oppose that increasing number of field lines coming out of the page, right? So you, according to Lenz's law, you have to have a clockwise induced, and that's how you determine it. 
because you have more dots, so you want to have more dots. Now for the generator effect, uh, okay, so this is basically, uh, we, I think we talked about this already, uh, it will just produce uh, an alternating current. And an alternating current is governed by uh, sine waves, right? So when you rotate the loop of wire, you're going to have a constantly changing magnetic flux, right? And so we can define the angle to be equal to omega t, right? So the angle is nothing but uh, the, the change in the angles with respect to time is nothing but the angular velocity. So we multiply by the velocity on both sides, we get omega t. Um, of course, the unit vector, which is perpendicular to the uh, surface of this loop of wire, to the well, there's not really a surface; it's just a cross section of area of the loop of wire, because the loop of wire itself physically is just a line, right? It's a two-dimensional figure. It's a circle. And so. Uh, um, the magnetic flux will be V dot N hat A, right? Which is, you know, it's kind of unnecessary to say it has N hat A. We could just, we usually just say V dot DA, right? And DA will be uh, the this uh, infinitesimal um, unit vector, right? So this is equal to VA cosine theta, right? Because we want to find the magnitude of it. Uh, because, but now you have a changing angle. So you have to have the cosine theta. Uh, but not, theta is nothing but omega t. It's have that uh, maximum, okay, the maximum flux will be VA, right? Because when cosine, the cosinus of theta is equal to one, that means that the angle is zero. My right? cosine of zero is one. You have a maximum flux, which is VA, right? So VA, we can substitute that by phi max. And therefore you have that, the equation of flux for a changing, okay, for, a, for a spinning loop of wire. You have that the flux is nothing but the maximum flux that you can attain multiplied by the cosinus of omega. And so, and so using Faraday's law of induction, uh, you're going to have, of course, uh, induced EMF because you have a constantly changing magnetic flux, right? It's, it's a function of omega t, it's a function of time. Therefore, you take the derivative of this, take the derivative, right? It's easy. Uh, it's nothing but negative cosine, I'm sorry, negative sine. But of course, the negatives cancel out, right? Don't forget the negative sign for Lenz's law. That cancels out and you get a positive uh, sign. You get VA omega sine omega t. And remember that uh, VA uh, omega will be nothing but the uh, you know, initial EMF. Okay, so this will be, this will be the EMF induced. Okay, so that will be EMF zero multiplied by sinus of omega t. So MF0, okay, is the peak value of the induced EMF, is the maximum value. Okay, so look at the next. Okay, so when the dipole moment is perpendicular to the field, you have a maximum induced EMF, right? Um, because the cross product will be, um, you know, will, will yield the maximum when the sine is, uh, when the theta in, in sine is 90. So when sine is one, you have a maximum uh, EMF. Okay, so now uh, here is a comparison of how my uh, AC and DC generators work. Okay, so there are very mild differences. Okay, over here for the AC generator, uh, you have uh, you know a couple couple of loops of, of wire over here, and this will produce a uh, changing current, right? It's as a function of omega. So what's going to happen is this is going to spin, right? Because like we saw over here, the induced EMF will de depend on the sine of omega t. Therefore, you have an alternating current because voltage is proportional to the current. And so if it's proportional to the sine of t, you're going to have an alternating current. So now for direct current, you only want to produce an induced uh, you know, current in one direction, right? And that's it. One direction, that's every current. So it will always be positive. And then you have the comparison, the comparison over here. Okay, uh, the blue uh, function will be direct current, and the brown function will be the alternating current. Okay, so um, now this is a numerical example. We have a coil of wire, right? 
and it has a number of turns. So you have to take that into account and you want to find what's the induced DMA. You use Faraday's law. Okay, so then uh, you already know that, you know, the magnetic field is uh, it's going to be increasing, right? It, excuse me, it's going to decrease from one Tesla to negative one Tesla. Therefore, the net change is minus two Tesla. Um, it has 1,000 turns, okay? So it can produce a pretty strong, uh, you know, uh, magnetic field, even stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, right? Um, and the, y, the area of that, the cross-sectional area of the coil is three centimeters. Where you plug in the numbers, making sure that you end up with KMS units, okay, use the dimensional analysis, and then you get a D5, DT total is minus 72 volts. But don't forget about Lenz's law, right? So you have a positive 72 volts. So the induced uh, voltage is 72 volts. Okay. So oftentimes the um, this this in, uh, you know changing magnetic flux creates a magnetic field, right? And so that is called a back EMF. That this this uh, is going to create something that's called a back EMF. So it's basically, you know, like the word states, it's going to be an EMF opposing the original uh, EMF. Okay, so that the um, that will drive the current in the magnetic field opposing the uh, you know magnetic flux according to Lenz's law. Okay, so here's a basic transformer. Um, the current has to be changing right for some time. After the switch closes, right? So then you have a change in magnetic flux through the coil, and the uh, change in magnetic flux, right, will create an induced current. And you have a secondary uh, EMF and current. That same thing will create another current and EMF. And that's how gen uh, transformers work. Okay. Now, from here, uh, this is uh, where we arrive to Faraday's, you know, general. Uh, law, right? So the definition of Faraday law in a general form. So here, what we're going to state is the following. So we have we have a coil, right? We have a basic, basically a solenoid, right? So this is a thin solenoid has n turns, and there is a magnetic field flow into it, right? This magnetic field is uniform inside of the solenoid, okay? And uh, supposing that you know the magnetic field uh, outside of the solenoid is zero because it's an ideal solenoid, uh, you're going to have a galvanometer, a yeah, wire of loop to measure what's going to be the current, right? Galvanometer is measure current in amps. And so we know that from Ampere's law, right? The closed loop integral of beta, D, beta DL will be equal to mu zero times the enclosed current. So now you have several loops of wire, you take that into account. And so, what happens next is that you know to find the magnetic flux, you just multiply that magnetic field by the area, the cross-sectional area. Okay, so and then what comes next is that you have, of course, uh, an induced EMF. So you take the derivative. Okay, there's set that equal to it, and you get that the induced uh, current is nothing by EMF over R, right? So it's a result of uh, of Ohm's law. Okay, now there is to be an induced current, right? But if you think about it, the magnetic field is not going to be produced outside of the coil. So how how is it possible, right, that you're going to have uh, an induced current on the galvanometer and you're going to get a reading, you're going to get a reading in amps? So what happens is that, you know, there, because there's no lens force acting on the charges, right? Uh, then there will be an electric field, okay? But then that's strange, right? Because this electric field is not, it's not a vector field. It's just it's just a non-conservative uh, field, right? So it's it's a vector that flows along the loop of wire, right? In 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 a counterclockwise direction in this case, right? So you look at that. Uh, so the field will create a motion, right, of charges. So the charges will move uh, thanks to this uh, electric field, and so. But because it's moving the charges, it has to do work on it, right? So the work uh, by the electric field is not conservative, right? So what's going to happen is that uh, you to find the work of the uh, electric field, 
you're going to set, okay, you're going to set the uh, QE, which is the electric force, right? So you have the electric field, which is E, multiplied by the charge, which is moving, that you get a force, right? And you multiply that force by the, uh, you know, the distance which it's going to move it. Now, in this case, the distance is uh, the circumference of that loop, which is 2 pi r, right? And so it's that, you're going to, you know, you're not going to get zero because this field is non-conservative, okay? So then uh, from this, uh, you know, you can generalize Faraday's law. You can say that, uh, let's say that the loop, you know, it's no longer uniform. Let's say it's not just a loop. It could be any any shape, right? It, it could be any regular shape. In that case, you're going to have to integrate. You have to use a line in it for the electric field, uh, for the work done by the electric field. So then you have that EMF. Okay, so this is generalized by this law. EMF induced is nothing but the closed loop integral of E dot DL, which is equal to the negative change in magnetic flux. And this is one of Maxwell's equations. Okay, this is one of uh, Max, most important, you know, Maxwell's equations, uh, which is a combination of, you know, Lenz's law, uh, Faraday's law, and work done by the electric field uh, uh, around some path, right? It doesn't matter which path it is. Uh, you can use that. But, uh, you know, for the purposes of this course, this course it, it will mostly, most of the time, it will be just, uh, you know, circular loop, a wire. So we talked about this. Okay, so uh, over here, uh, they, are, they are using uh, Gauss's law, okay? So which says that any radial component of the electric field will require an enclosed charge. Okay, so um, the magnitude of the electric field is constant on any circular integration path, okay, due to, to its symmetry, right? Now, if it's not a cylind you know, circular path, it might be a different for each point. But now, for, you know, we're going to calculate what's the electric field, right? Using uh, Faraday's law now um, for each, okay, distance. So we're going to consider the distance, the radial distance R, right? So the radius of the loop, which is going to be R. And we're going to consider also the distance that come, comes out of that uh, loop. So greater than R. So when R is greater than R, so outside of the circular integration path, you have that the integral, the closed loop integral of E dot DL is nothing but the uh, magnetic field, which is constant in this case. It's not changing uh, the magnitude, right? It's not changing. It's multiplied by the closed loop integral of E uh, DS, and that's 2 pi r, right? That's the circumference. That's EMF. Now you use flux BA, and then the area is pi r squared. So you said that EMF equals to that uh, change in with respect to time, and you get uh, E times 2 pi r equals to pi r squared dB dt. And so you get a formula for the electric field okay, outside of the integration of the integration path, right, the circular path, and that's going to be the radius, uh, the original radius of the loop squared um, divided by 2 times uh, the radius of the integration path, okay, multiplied by the changing magnetic field with respect to time. Now, when it's inside of the, the uh, integration path, okay, you're going to have, you know, a little, just a little bit different. So the only difference is that this time uh, you're going to use R, right, instead of uh, big R, and you're going to have E is equal to R over 2 times dB dt. And then you can have a nice graph. Uh, clearly, R over here is the, is the, uh, the variable, right? Big, big R is a constant, right? That's just a radial distance. But then little r, you can change it. We can change that. So you have a graph over here. It grows linearly, right, from the center. And then when it reaches the integration path, it will fall as a function of 1 over r. Now, this is pretty much the end of this uh, section for part of this law. This is all supplementary material. Um, so what I'm going to do is quickly go over this, go over this on your own. Uh, so this is just uh, you know a little bit of an explanation of Lenz's law over here. So um, remember that uh, you know Lenz's law is pretty much a consequence of the conservation of energy, right? So over here, 
what's going to be the change in magnetic flux? Well, it's zero, right? Even though it's moving, right? There's no magnetic field that's that's changing, right? The area is constant unless you squish the slip of wire. So therefore, it's zero. Now, for this second example, you're entering a uniform magnetic field. And so the area that covers that magnetic field inside of the loop is increasing. Therefore, you have an induced EMF. And you have there an induced current. Okay, so uh, d, d phi dt is into uh, the slide, right? And the induced current will be uh, counterclockwise, right? Because you have to make sure that that induced current produces a magnetic field opposing the change in magnetic flux. And the original flux uh, uh, flux goes into the pitch, right? So you want that flux to come out of the pitch. So it's got to be counterclockwise. Using the thumb rule, you can find out what's the direction of the magnetic field. Now, for the third uh, example, it's going to be right? Because it's, there's no change. For the fourth example, it has to change, right? Because it's coming out of that, uh, that area, the uniform magnetic field. And of course, the last one is zero as well. Okay, so this is just uh, AC DC generators. All right. Okay, so this is just extra stuff. All of this is, uh, you know, you don't really have to do this, but it would be nice to look at. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a field sample from the past common exams so that you can practice. All right, so let me. So hopefully you can see this. All right, so let's try a few questions from this uh, common exam uh, from, I think it's, well, it doesn't really say when it's from, but it's old, okay? So it's a, it's a past exam and, um, Okay, so let's try a few questions over here that relate to Faraday's law. So, all right, so for question 22, uh, we have a wire, right, that uh, slides to the right. So it's basically uh, a rod, okay, slides to the right, and a speed of 10 meters per second it gives you the speed uh -huh, on two metallic wires. So it's just the rails. Um, and they are 15 centimeters, 50 centimeters apart. Let me see if I can. Uh, Use the pen now. Hopefully, it's not locked. Okay. So the separation over here, the distance, the vertical distance, is going to be 50 centimeters, which is nothing but 0.5 meters, right? 0.5 meters. Uh, now the resistor over here. Next, these two rails, and then the slider will move in a increasing, uh, you know, its magnetic flux because the area will be increasing. Uh, the magnitude of this magnetic field that is in each will be equal to one Tesla. It's pretty strong, right, compared to the magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, okay, so it will be one Tesla. 
Okay, so now the question is, uh, what is going to be the magnitude and the direction of the current through the resistor? Okay, so we have to take a few things into account. We have to think about uh, Lenz's law. So, of course, uh, Lenz's law, yeah. Because you have an opposing so the the direction. Right, you have to think about which direction it will flow, right? But first, first we can find, right, uh, out of just the magnitudes, we can find the uh, induced current, right? We can use uh, Faraday's law, right? So um, I think we derived this equation on that uh, EMF, right? EMF, the induced EMF. Is not yeah, you think EMF thing. as a battery. Right, EMF will be, because this, this will behave like a battery, right? So what's going to happen is that, you know, like we saw in the example, this loop of wire, this wire over here that's moving, will will be in electrostatic equilibrium, right? Because it's moving in a magnetic field, so the Lorentz force will bring positive charges to one side, right? It will bring positive charges to one side and the negative charges to the other side. It will polarize the the um, this uh, wire, right? And so the let's say that the electric field will flow down. But we're not certain, right? We are not yet certain. We don't know in which direction the current will flow, because we has to, it has to be uh, you know, consistent with Lenz's law. So we're just assuming it will go down for now. But uh, you know, we're not entirely sure. It's just uh, for visualization purposes, right? So then um, we're going to have this uh, wire in electrostatic equilibrium. And we have that the induced EMF is nothing but minus d phi dt, right? So this is minus d phi d. My pen is not uh, not helping today. Okay, so let's try this again. Okay, so we derived the equation, right? We, we know that uh, the induced EMF will not will be nothing but okay. Uh, Minus the change in the in the magnetic flux, right? But now the magnetic flux is b times a, b times dA, right? So let's assume that it's a maximum, right? Because over here we know that we know that the velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Therefore, uh, v cross b is uh, b v, right? So it's uh, you have a hundred percent of the magnetic flux, and so you have the derivative of b times a, right, with respect to time. Somebody forget to uh, mute themselves. Okay, so try to solve this problem on your own uh, using Faraday's law. So I'm just going to show you the derivation over here, and then you go on, and then I'll let you know what happens. Okay, I'll give you five minutes. Um, let me see. I think I can, I can uh, annotate this without having to use WebEx because the WebEx pen is just terrible. So let me just so try this on your own. Use file this law. Take a pen and a paper. And take the derivative of B A. Okay, and then think about what's going on with the magnetic field. The magnetic field is constant, uh, constant right? But the area is changing. Wait for that. And two. And drop your answers in the chat, or you can uh, you can unmute yourself and then explain how you got. Okay. 
and to better pen over here. Okay. Here's what we're gonna do. Not love. So, oh, just leave it right when I was uh, closing it. Okay. Um, So we're gonna do it. Oh, 
future slides because you know we don't want to get the other. So let's um, I'm gonna try to put in the meantime in the background, but uh, in the meantime, I'm just okay. so. Okay, so let's see. Okay, and do you want to have a break? What's that? Um, I'm trying to uh, load some uh, files, right, for the practice exams, but uh, I'm having problems with the, with this, yeah, with, she's doing some slow. I want to, uh, uh, or just go over the, the slides for next lecture. Because the pen of the WebEx has, it's, uh, so it just uh, doesn't work properly.
you know, in the chat. Because I'm having some problems with speed. Can you see the slides or not? Good, we can see the slides. Okay, good. Okay, good. So now for this lecture, uh, we're just going to talk about, uh, you know, inductance and uh, our, what's called RL circuits. So RL circuits are basically uh, circuits that contain uh, resistors and inductors. And of course, inductance stands for L. Okay, so um, this is chapter 30 of the your book, your textbook, sections one through four. And we're going to talk about inductors, right? Uh, Self-inductance, and this comes, of course, from uh, Faraday's law. Uh, current growth decay, current de uh, and uh, the energy stored in the magnetic field, uh, density of that energy. And mutual inductance. Okay, so we already discussed that you know a change in magnetic flux directly induces electric fields. Okay, and that's that's an example of mutual inductance, right? A simple transformer. Okay, we talked about um, found that uh, you know the induced current will, will be produced by a non-conservative electric field. Okay, so the magnetic field of that solenoid, of course, is mu zero i times the number of loops. Um, therefore, the magnetic flux will be the magnetic field multiplied by the air. Um, so what you have is that you know the derivative of the flux with respect to time, you get um, mu zero negative mu zero n multiplied by di dt. Okay, so the dt is nothing but the change in current. In the the current is not constant, and this whole thing is just called uh, m. Okay, so mu zero and a is called m. Okay, so it's just a fact. It's, like, it's a constant, pretty much, in this case. So the IDT is positive. Um, the magnetic field it means that the magnetic field is growing, it's increasing, uh, and that the induced magnetic field will oppose the change uh, in the magnetic flux in the original magnetic flux. So we talked about this. This is pretty much a question. Okay, so um, now let's talk about uh, mutual and self-inductance. Okay, so mutual and self-inductance, mutual inductance between coils, okay, is basically the IDT in primary so, uh, produces electric field uh, that will induce another current, right? So that EMF is the one responsible for that current I2. Nothing but the transformer. Uh, so the self induction uh, includes the same effects in a coil. Okay, so the current, the IDT in a single coil, generates a change in magnetic flux, right? Because the current is not constant. So if the current is not constant, that means that the magnitude of the magnetic field that is produced is changing. So that will produce, okay, another uh, magnetic field in is opposing changing in flux. Okay, so uh, about the back EMF that is produced. All right, so um, the inductance uh, can be included in the in Faraday's law. So we can see that that uh, EMF induced equals to negative L di dt. And that's because of okay, the, uh, you know, uh, the voltage will be proportional to the change in current. So the more change in current, the more that you have uh, increasing, then you're going to have more voltage. That's also proportional to that uh, inductance okay, in the equation. Okay, so to calculate the self-inductance, uh, we are just going to define this. So we know that we know that uh, you know the uh, ID times times the inductance L is equal to the number of loops 
times the flux, right? So now if you just uh, get rid of the differential signs, you can solve for the inductance. And inductance is nothing but the number of loops multiplied by the flux divided by the current, okay? Uh, we already know that the capacitance, right? In, in, in When you looked at this chapter, uh, when you talk about capacitance, capacitance uh, is only a geometric uh, you know, dependency. So it, it basically is a uh, charge divided by voltage, okay? Uh, but now in this case, uh, inductance is, uh, is flux divided by uh, current, okay? So, now the SI units for uh, inductance is the Henry, okay? Uh, that's uh, in memory of Joseph Henry, that actually, you know, he himself uh, discovered, uh, he observed, you know, with the experimental analysis how uh, far this law works uh, in the United States on the same year. So, um, you know, it probably is that uh, far they published the papers uh, than Joseph Henry did. Uh, so that's why it's called Faraday's law and not Henry's law. But, uh, you know, in any case, uh, he's got some some uh, credit for it by calling the SI unit for inductance uh, Henry. Okay, so, okay, in order to, uh, to find out, right, that this uh, this is consistent, you take the derivative on both sides, right? And then you end up with the same result of Faraday's law. So you get up you have with EL, right? The inductance, the inductance uh, you know, back EMF is equal to minus L DID. Okay. Now, this is an example over here to find this inductance of a solenoid. Okay, so to find the uh, self inductance of a solenoid, you L equals N phi B divided by I. Uh, now we already know that the flux, okay, through that coil is nothing but uh, the number of loops times the area, okay, divided by the length, so multiplied by mu zero, which is the permittivity of free space, and then you get mu zero N squared times H, okay. And so you over here, you have that EMF induced is equal to minus N multiplied by mu zero times NA divided by L, the IDT. And then you get a minus mu zero times N squared. Okay, by plugging that in the equation, and multiply by A divided by L, and then multiply by the changing current, gives you the inductance uh, minus L, the IDT. Okay. Now, to calculate the uh, self-inductance, this is an example over here, a numerical example. So all you do is you, uh, you know, you use the equation L equals mu zero n square A divided by L, okay, the length the, the length of that uh, solenoid. And here you have uh, an example where the solenoid has 1,000 turns. Uh, the radius is going to be 0.5 meters, and the length is 0.2 meters, right? So then you multiply the permittivity of free space by the square of the number of loops, square of 1,000, by the cross-sectional area. Phi are squared, so phi times 0.2 squared. And all of that divided by the length. And so you get a 49.4 milli. Okay. So for ideal inductor that uses uh, solenoid abstract, Okay, you have a uh, you know zero internal resistance. Okay, for ideal, the magnetic field is equal to zero outside, and inside is going to be mu zero i times the number of loops. Okay, so for an, an ideal solenoid, so an inductor is pretty much an ideal solenoid. Ideal inductor, okay, have internal resistances in series, and uh, you know that is described by uh, Ohm's law. So that um induced voltage will be equal to EMF minus uh, little i times little r. Okay, so that's the terminal voltage, just because it has a, a resistance, pretty much like a, you know, like a battery, it has a resistance. Okay, and the direction of that ir, okay, it depends on the current. And the direction of EMF depends on the ID. Okay, and then constant current implies 
uh, the induced voltage is nothing but zero. So the inductor behaves like a wire with resistance R. Okay, so if the current is increasing, we know that uh, it's proportional to EMF, but EMF is proportional to minus N d phi dt. So if I increases, phi d dt is equal to zero. It's greater than zero, excuse me. And so the EMF will oppose an increase in, in the current R. Power is, is stored in the magnetic field of a conductor. Therefore, there is energy stored in the uh, conductor. Okay, so if I, in, in the other case, if I is decreasing, d phi dt is, greater, is less than zero. And so uh, MF will be decrease in current. Okay, so in this case, the power is stopped from the field uh, of the inductor. But now, if the current I is constant, or in that case, the uh, you know there's no change. There's no change in magnetic flux, and so you're going to have no induced EMF. Like a wire. Okay, so here's a question for you: Which statement describes the current through the inductor below? If the induced EMF is as shown, okay. So which is uh, is going to be uh, you know the right answer for? The current to the inductor. So the A will go to the right. Any suggestions? In which direction will, will the current flow? So it has to be in the opposite direction, right? Because it has to oppose okay, that change in current. Current will go to the right, according to the uh, EMF that flows to the inductor. And so the inductor will generate, okay, will generate a magnetic field that creates a back EMF. So it will go leftward. And it's, uh, it's going to be uh, constant. It's going to be decreasing, right? Now, in this example, the current increases uniformly from 0 to 1 amps in 0.1 seconds. Okay, so we're defining in this voltage, EMF uh, sub L, or also known as back EMF, across a uh, 50 millihenry. So we uh, use the equation, you know, EMF equals to the minus L di dt, and then you substitute, okay, you're changing current over changing time, you get 10 amps per second, uh, and then you can find uh, these, uh, you know, you can find the back EMF because you already have the inductance. So you multiply the inductance times negative one times the change in current, you get minus 0.5 volts. Okay, so negative, of course, from uh, Lenz's law, right, has to oppose the change uh, in current. So it's in the opposite direction. And of course, uh, you know, inductors are uh, everywhere, pretty much. They are in your computers, uh, in, uh, you know, transformers, um, everywhere where you can find circuitry, most of the time you will find inductors, okay? They're also called uh, coils, uh, you know, which are, of course, part of very important uh, circuits. Um, and most of the time they are used as AC filters, okay? But uh, you know, so the uh, applications of uh, inductors, and this clearly shows that uh, you know Faraday law, Faraday's law uh, runs the economy because without Faraday's law, you wouldn't be able to explain this properly, and there will be no intuition whatsoever in regards to how inductors work. And so you wouldn't have transformers, and you wouldn't have a reliable source of energy to you know feed how many thousands, many millions of uh, homes every day, right? Electricity is uh, constantly supplied to millions of people every day. So Faraday's law is extremely important for the 
world in uh, you know in which we live in today uh, runs the economy pretty much now uh, in person circuits so we're going to talk about the r circuit where you have an inductor circuit right with resistance r okay so this is very similar to uh, rc circuits right but it's a little bit different so it's just that okay but in this case we have an inductor uh, capacitor and remember that the capacitor stored uh, electric uh, energy, right? So electric field energy. But now in this case, you, the induction store uh, magnetic field energy. Okay, so you can derive the equations okay for yeah, using Kirchhoff's loop rule. And so you you just look around the circuit, and then you sum all the voltages, which you know the change of the voltages should be equal to zero. So if you have an EMF, which is your total voltage, uh, you have to subtract the voltage across the resistor and the inductor. So you're going to have uh, EMF minus IR plus LDI dt equals to zero. Okay. Um, now, of course, the DAC EMF is going to have a differential terminate for current. So you can find the solution to the differential equation. So we're going to find the solution to this differential equation. Now, in this case, if you can notice here, uh, EMF, you know, is clearly uh, going to be positive, negative, right? Because according to Lenz's law, it has to oppose the change in current, right? So EMF sub L has to be minus L D I D T. But then when you put it into Kirchhoff's slope rule, it stays negative. And if you think about that, because it's in the opposite direction, right? The back EMF will go in the opposite direction of the loop that you're drawing, the future of law. So that is why it doesn't change sign. Okay, so you'll be EMF total minus IR, okay, the voltage across the resistor minus LDI dt. Here in this uh, LR circuit, we have uh, several switches. Right? So we have two switches, and we can, uh, you know, simultaneously open or close the switch whenever we want. Um, we can, uh, you know, leave the circuit on its own um, with no source, uh, with no voltage source. So, what happens at uh, t equals zero seconds is that uh, the current will go, okay, from zero, from EMF, back EMF to minus EMF. Okay, so it will grow, okay, uh, in, initially. So, but I is going to be zero. Now, later on, uh, after you know some long time, uh, the current is going to be clockwise and it's going to start growing. So the back EMF will oppose you know, the original EMF, the direction of the original current. And as T approaches infinity, the current is fresh, okay, but it's going to stabilize. And so the IDT will be zero. And therefore, EMF, back EMF is zero. Okay? And so the total the total current will just be EMF of R. According to Ohm's law, essentially the inductor will be nothing but wire. Okay. All right. So the magnetic field energy stored in the inductor uh, will be absorbed by the resistor. Okay. And so what it's said is that this will decay in phase, right? So when you when you put the switch to B, it will decay in phase. Okay, so then you have a Kirchhoff's loop rule. Now you don't have the original voltage, right? So the total voltage is zero. There's no voltage across. So minus IR minus LDI dt is zero. Change in the voltage is equal to zero. Okay, and so um, as T goes to infinity, uh, the current will just uh, decrease and it will go to zero because there's no you know volt voltage source that can supply the circuit with current. The, uh, the differential equation okay, for this simple circuit is only one inductor and one resistor. Okay, so over here we have uh, minus IR plus uh, EMF sub L, and we know that's minus L di dt. We set it equal to, you know, we put it on the other side, and we get that di dt is equal to minus R over L uh, times I. And of course, you can integrate both sides. Uh, by separation of variables, 
and you get natural logs, then you uh, exponentiate both sides. Um, and so you get something like this. You get the current uh, is in terms of, you know, in, in, uh, as a function of time, is going to be the maximum current I0, okay? Uh, multiply e to the negative t over tau sub l, where tau sub l is nothing but a time constant. Okay, so remember that in uh, RC circuits, the time constant was RC. Okay, so that was the time. Um, so in this case, uh, the time constant is is L divided by R. So it's the inductance divided by the resistance. That's the only difference. So then, in this case, if you let t uh, approach infinity, this entire current will go to zero, right? The current stabilizes. That's what it's uh, when it said that you know the current approaches to zero. Okay, and of course, you know we didn't even bother solving the first uh, differential equation because it's a uh, well, it's still a homogeneous first order differential equation. You can solve can be solved uh, trivially by using uh, you know simple methods of um, Separation of variables, but now in this case we have a non-constant term in it, so you have to use uh, a different method. Uh, but then you don't have to worry about that. It's very unlikely that it will be on the exam. It's going to be a simple uh, differential equation like this when you have no voltage source. Okay, but if you're curious, I, I will try to post okay a video about that in my YouTube channel to solve that differential equation. If you have not taken the course yet, I will go over the details. And then, uh, so you can, uh, you know, take a look at it. Okay, now here, um, we can solve for, you know, several things. We can solve for the voltage using Ohm's law. Uh, and so we can multiply both sides by R, right? And we get EMF. So then we get EM back EMF is equal to maximum EMF times to the power of negative tau over um, tau spell. In an a circuit, okay, we have a growth first phase solution. Okay, so for this, here we have a I plus L over R di dt equals to EMF over R. So then you substitute EMF uh, sub L into you know the equation. And, um, over here, it's nothing but, of course, uh, like I said, a first order differential equation. And uh, over here, they solved it for you. Okay, so that's uh, that's cool. Uh, and then you get I is equal to I uh, multiplied by one minus e to the minus t over tau sub n. Okay, so the total uh, current as t approaches infinity will be the total, uh, you know, EMF. When you have total EMF, have EMF over R is an Ohm's law. Okay, so. Um, then over here you have uh, the same, you know, use the same uh, thing to find the back EMF. You multiply both sides by R, and then you have, of course, EMF sub L, which is the back EMF equals to minus total EMF times e to the minus uh, T over tau. And the voltage drops across the resistor. Um, okay, so that's going to be minus IR. Over so here, a numerical example. Uh, Mac EMF as a function of time, right? So you can use the growth the growth phase solution, uh, EMF over R times one minus E to the power of minus T over tau to find the uh, Mac EMF, right? So you solve you use this, um, and then at T equals zero, of course the current will be zero. And so because we know that the back EMF is proportional to the rate of change of the current. Uh, you take a derivative on both sides, and then you just get that, okay? And multiplying it by the induct gives you the back EMF. Okay, so then uh, t equals zero, back EMF equals the negative of the total EMF. Zero, uh, back EMF is equal to the battery potential. Okay, so we said that. Just act like a wire at t equals zero. No current flows through instantaneously. Now, after a bit of time, 
uh, time, right? Especially in uh, some textbooks, they will even say after 10 tau, right? Because 10 tau apparently is a good time for the uh, inductor to stabilize. So then after a long time, the inductor will stabilize and the back EMF will be zero, right? So then the total current, okay, at t equals infinity will be not but uh, five amps. Here's a question for you. The current through battery um, one, okay, um, are three loops below, which have identical inductors, resistors and batteries, but different uh, arrangements. Rank them in terms of current through the battery. Okay, so you're gonna think about uh, what's going to be greatest first, right after the switch is closed. Which one is going to have the greatest current through the battery? You're going to rank from there. Okay, so think about it and drop the answers in the chat. When? Yes, Dr. Chin? When? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think uh, you may want to compare the RC circuit with. A our air circuit. Uh, can, can the students hear me? Yeah. Now, in the RC circuit and our air circuit, there's similarity and difference. I think what I, uh, you know, when, you know, derive the differential equation, all these things, that's very good. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, of course, in the, in the exam, the final, they will not ask you to to uh, derive the equation. They would. The important thing is, is this: you have to identify it using which equation, because the, the the all the formulas are given. So let me tell you these things: in the RC circuit and the RL circuit, in both cases, there are only two kinds of curve. One is going up, one is going down. Okay. Now, as I said, the you, if you remember, you know, in the RC circuit, right? Uh, when you know, because typically it's like uh, you, 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 you have RC circuit, then switch on charge. When the charge, the current RC circuit, the current going through the resist, it's going down. Then the yeah. the, the 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 voltage across the capacitor is going up. So, so the current is going down, the voltage is going up. There's only two cases, going down or going up. Then in the RL circuit, it's opposite. It's opposite. Let's say the current is going up, the voltage is going down. So now you you you, you compare these things, then you 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 know you know uh, what I'm talking about, okay? And the other thing you have to know is this, you know when when you start, when you start, when you just switch on, because you have a RC and a RL, right? Then you switch on. Before you switch on, nothing happened. You switch on, then the RC circuit, switch on, switch on, because the RC circuit, you switch on, the see the capacitor, no voltage, right? So you can see the, 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 the capacitor is like a short hit. In the when RC circuit when I switch on, switch on, then the capacitor at the beginning is shorted because there's no there's no voltage across the capacitor. You get it, right? So that's why in the beginning the current is very big, right? Then voltage capacitor very small. Now in the in the case of RL circuit, the opposite. Uh, okay, opposite. What, what I mean is this: when you switch on. When you switch on, you know the the switch on, you know the, the the current changes, right? The current changes. So current changes because the 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 voltage in the air depends on the on on the on the on the on the change in the voltage, right? It's it's in inductor, it's inductance. So it's opposite. So the R RC's current is RL's voltage. And RC's voltage and IR's current. Uh, maybe you know when you can you can you can do some more more example. 
and uh, and uh, you know not not doing these mathematical derivation, but tell them how to figure out physically using your intuition, using your your understanding of the of the case to figure out what is the correct answer. Okay. Now, Juan, do you want to have a break? Sure. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we have, uh, well, it's, what, it goes up to nine, right? So we're an hour left. I was waiting for the... It's uh, up to you. Okay. Yeah, so uh, let's do... Uh, the important thing is this. There's only two, only two cases. One is going up, one is going down. <laughs> if you got to have, to, you have to use a going up equation or going down equation, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I'll go over this. So, so here's the thing. Uh, the hint is uh, what kind of wire? Okay. So if it's uh, you know ordinary or broken, that's L act like. So over here they're asking, uh, you know, which one, which current will be greatest, the first. We have different arrangements uh, of the circuit, but then for two of those you're going to have a a, a resistor in, uh, in uh, parallel, right? So the voltage across the resistor in parallel will be the same, right? So if you have a resistor in parallel with the inductor, the voltage will be the same, the voltage drop, right? But then in series, it will be different if you have a resistor, right? The current that will flow less because of the system that goes through it. So for three, uh, three and two, uh, you could assume that it will be, we are pretty much about the same current will be flowing from positive to negative, right? So if you imagine the current flowing to positive to negative, it will go through the, through the least resistance as possible, right? So it will go through the resistor in part three, right, in, in uh, figure three, and then it will cross the inductor, and it will come back to the battery. Right? Some, some current will flow through the parallel, parallel resistor. Then that's going to, uh, you know, uh, that, that means that the current will be less, right? So half you could say some 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 of the current will flow through the resistor, and some of the other current will flow through the inductor. And the same thing happens for um, for part two, okay, so for figure two. And now the current will be much less, right, because the resistance will be greater on the other side. So three should be greatest uh, after one, because one okay, will have all current flowing in that circuit. So one is greatest. And then you can say that uh, uh, three is second, uh, I mean, two is second, and then uh, and three is last. So the answer should be A. Okay. 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 So now for this, this one, I think this. Um, so for this, the only difference is that, uh, you know, after all time, the switch is, is going to be clutched. So we're considering, well, okay, sorry, this is uh, having issues with this uh, slide. Computer should be slow today.
Um, that's what you mean? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Um, uh -huh. I cannot see you. <laughs> yeah, well, you, well what, what is the question? Yeah. Uh, you go ahead. Slides. Yeah. Uh, Just for a moment. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah I'm having some uh, issues with the uh, it's crashing, uh, and then my computer just freezes up. Okay, let me see if I can. Somehow. I think it's. Let me see if you can see this. I was able to load the uh, practice log and so on, pass them an exam. By the way, Juan, I've got a quick question. Yeah, of course. Um, the exam, is it going to be using Lockdown Browser for physics? Uh, I think it will be used the uh, in U. So if you have used Proctor U, U, yeah. Uh, most likely. So, and uh, they still have not, uh, you know, decided when the final exam is going to be. But uh, for exam three, 50% uh, of the questions will be uh, coming from exam two content, and the other 50% will be coming from exam three. Okay. So it will be, yeah, it will be an uh, equal distribution for questions for both parts. So that one's going to be on Proctor U as well? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Thanks. From right, so I can see this is a uh, 
All right, so here we have an example of uh, Faraday's law. Okay, so here we have the water, right? Like we were saying earlier, we heard, uh, was loading, okay, of 50 centimeters length, and uh, it has a resistor, right, of 50 ohms. So the rails are connected by this resistor. Um, and so we have to find the magnitude and direction of the current, right? I think I can write, yeah, there you go. This is much better. All right, so Good. Uh, for you're still lagging pretty heavy for me. Uh, There's a big problem yeah, for me as well. All right, um, so we can, uh, we'll stop here for now, and then I'll post some, uh, I'll post a supplementary video with this practice problems uh, up on my channel so you can check it out. Okay. I, I can, it depends, so I couldn't even write on this. We have through 30, and then be able to finish. Uh, I can't. And uh, hopefully that uh, can help. Okay, so.